Thank you very much, um, Richard and Oliver, also for the invitation to be able to speak in front of you. Thank you very much for that. Just a quickly time to open my presentation, which, after having heard so many intriguing talks um, on the history of coronation and assembly places, um, will, I fear, be quite peculiar because I am now focusing, actually, the recent 65 years, um, not the centuries before that. Um, while, of course, to come there, to come to 1949, um, which is in the title, uh, I feel I have to bridge a little and give some information on what actually happened after Louis IV and um, Charles IV, as Judith has been telling you. Um, until that very date. With this picture you can see already This picture, which is a very recent one, um, the actually quite interesting juxtaposition of the secular and the sacred power within the urban fabric of Aachen, uh, which comes, as we learn, from um, uh, from Louis and um, Charles the um, Fourth, and this is a separation which continued also even after the time uh, after 1531 which um, is the date of a, if not the, historic frustration for the Aachen people because it was the year of the last coronation that took place in Aachen. After that, um, Aachen almost vanished from uh, the international political stage for 300 years. Um, nevertheless, um, it was not more, but from an external perspective, even not less than a free imperial city, which meant it was independent from any other regional lordship. Um, and it had a considerably rich college, which was something special also in, in the whole empire. Um, the, this sort of marginal appearance for the time was uh, only 300 years later switched um, by a geopolitically speaking first recourse uh, to the Carolingian heritage, not by a German, but by Napoleon Bonaparte, who um, had a special attachment, personal attachment to Aachen. He had his son baptized there. He himself, of course, wanted to be put in the tradition of Charlemagne, which uh, from him was seen as one of the original emperors of um, of Europe, um, and um, what he did, so to say, as an administrative rehabilitation, he made Aachen the capital of an arrondissement, the got a prefecture, which uh, almost remained until 1972 in other terms, um, and he made the college or the collegiate church a cathedral because Aachen became a bishop's see at that time. Then again, in 1815, Aachen became Prussian, and um, this started a somewhat strange liaison between the Protestant and very conservative mainland and the liberal and Catholic Rhineland. We might as well see this with this image, uh, which is a state portrait of William I as Prussian king, not yet. Emperor of Germany. Um, this was painted um, for the commemoration of 50 years Rhineland being Prussian. And you see he's standing there in his full ornament with the Prussian flag in front of the cathedral, in front of the town hall. Um, by the way, this painting must be painted in Berlin, not in Aachen, because this square you see here does not exist at all. There is not enough space in front of the town hall to produce such an image, 
Um, and interestingly, it was painted not for Berlin, but it was painted for Aachen. As you can see, it's hanging until today in the town hall of Aachen. Not in the main room, in the main sitting room of um, the city council, it's Napoleon who's being presented. <laughs> uh, what else you can see is that, and this is this strange relation, what the Prussians, of course, did, they uh, put a lot of money in the rehabilitation of the different buildings. For instance, um, the town hall was re... Um, no, that's just a German word, you can't say it in English. Uh, it was returned into a neo-Gothic appearance um, while it was heavily uh, changed in Baroque times. Um, so that's what they did. It is, as David said, uh, one of these... Um, how did you put it? It was the Romantic Nationalism. Um, in, in German, we rather say historicism. Refrain a little from, from that, but of course it is that it is trying to to put the Prussians also into this legacy, even though not too too much, because Charlemagne was even by the Prussian kings seen as the patron of the Holy Roman Empire, and what they wanted to have was a new German Empire, not a Holy Roman one, especially not a Catholic one. In a way, this is the same, or this is also due for uh, the period between 33 and 45, because the National Socialists saw Charlemagne not as the German emperor. He was rather the slaughterer of the Saxons and anti-German, because of course Charlemagne had this war against the Saxons, and the, the Nazis rather liked Wiedekind to be seen as the important figure of that time. Only in the late 1930s, it was that Hitler changed, apparently he himself changed his mind, and uh, it, there's some quotes that he said that Charlemagne was one of the important uh, unifiers of German thought and thinking. Um, and interestingly, it was an SS division called Charlemagne later on, uh, which though was for French volunteers being in this SS division. Um, it is very interestingly that the region around Aachen and Cologne um, in the time of the regime um, remained, politically speaking, more conservative Catholic uh, than actually fascist. The, um, the election 1933, there is the county of Cologne and Aachen and Trier, the only ones where the majority is still with the Catholic party, with the Centrum. Um, and maybe this is also an, an image that proves that this is um, the, the pilgrimage in Aachen in 1937, which is the only one that took place during the Nazi government. Um, and in a city that at that time had 120,000 inhabitants, 800,000 people came for this pilgrimage. And even from the officials, it was seen as a demonstration against their policy. Then, um, of course, Aachen shares the destiny of a lot of European cities in World War II. Um, a lot of air raids, here you see that's the title of this image, which was taken by the later um, city conservator Hans Königs. Aachen is burning. The second air raid in July 10th, on July 10th, 1941, which already did a lot of harm to the city, of course. But on the other side, Aachen was um, unlucky to be so much in the West to get the first hits during that time, but also very lucky to be the first city to be liberated in 1944. And uh, as we know from statistics, um, the heaviest bomb impact was in the first months of 1945. So that Aachen um, did not uh, had to survive this. Still, um, in the end, Aachen had, was destructed almost 40%, and 40% was heavily damaged. 13 or 14,000 buildings were destroyed at that time. As for the buildings we are interested in, this is the cathedral, still during wartime, 1945. It looks quite fine, but um, as you might imagine from looking into these windows, uh, the inner part of it are almost all the bays, apart from one bay here, were destroyed by bombs getting into, um, into the building. Um, this wall here, which is mostly 19th century though, 
uh, was leaning one meter outside. So you can see they already put here some, uh, it's not a scaffolding, but static structures to prevent the wall from collapsing. The same is true for the cathedral, which where the outside walls remain, but all the glass windows were broken. Um, this, fortunately, only one attack actually uh, um, was bad for the cathedral, uh, which was though on Christmas Eve 1941. Um, all the glass windows were broken. This is um, part of German legacy of that time, the idea of the zero hour in 1945, from where everything started. Um, actually, I couldn't find an aerial view from the very center, but here you see this is the choir of the cathedral and this is the area around, so you can imagine um, the luck, actually, these buildings had not been completely destroyed at that time. What comes afterwards? Um, the zero hour changed the um, changed very much the thinking of the Germans and the Aachen people at that time. And the distinction between the sacred and the secular played an important role. In the reconstruction, you can see from this image from the 1960s, the cathedral was very quickly um, put back together, whereas the town hall only had some, um, some emergency repairs. And you can say, especially the roofs of the towers were, were not yet reconstructed in the 1960s. So there was a very um, peculiar difference making between what is, what is, so to say, contaminated by the history and uh, what we can, with what we can go on uh, without any problem. So this is, so to say, the issue between historicity and contemporaneity. The people wanted to have modern buildings, they wanted to have a modern life, they wanted to forget about everything that was historic. At the same time, they didn't want to be national, they wanted to be international. And um, interestingly enough, Charlemagne was a figure who was international. He was not seen national. For the town hall, um, as it was not yet repaired immediately, that's why, interestingly, you find in Chicago, at Chicago Tribune Tower, this small um, spolia of Aachen Cathedral. No one actually knows how it got there. Um, as for other things at the, um, at the town hall, you see this is the actual historic town hall, and this was a, um, a 19th century technical um, we call a technical town hall addition administrative building um, attached to the other uh, to the old town hall and this building was not so much destroyed actually but it was seen as um, Wilhelminian uh, as Prussian and that's why in 1958 one decided to um, destroy it and build a new modern um, administrative building for the town hall this is done by an architect called Graupner. Um, and the idea was also to, to, in a way, reconstruct spatially what one was knowing at that time from archaeological evidence. So this building was meant to show the facade of the corridor, which Judith was referring to. And this is the, um, yeah, the mysterious middle building, which was sat in the middle of this corridor. Um, actually, it's a primary school from the Catholic Church, you see there. So again, some uh, politics. Of course, after 45, the political climate in Europe changed very much. And um, Western Germany, fortunately, with Chancellor Adenauer, became much more West-orientated as, as it was before. Uh, you see here the European, the, the start of the European Union or the European Economic Community at first. Um, uh, Germany became part of the NATO and from this understanding, Aachen was no longer at the periphery of a German Empire, but now it was in the heart of Europe. And this new Europe resembled very much the old Carolingian Empire. <laughs> It's, we cannot know um, whether um, 
the guy whose name I have to find, Kurt Pfeiffer, was foreseeing this, actually. But in 1945, uh, this Mr. Pfeiffer, who was a co-founder of the Christian Democratic Party in Aachen, got some friends together and they said, what we have to do, we have to set a signal for the future out of our history. Uh, and Charlemagne is our most prominent figure. And what we do is um, we're having a prize handed out for people who do something for Europe, the Sha International Charlemagne Prize. This is important. It's always International Charlemagne Prize. Just remember, if you want to get rid of national things, it must be international. So they got together on uh, December 19th, 1945, and uh, Susan First Lorry, which was Richard Nikolaus Kodenhofer Kalergi, um, who was a Japanese Austrian who was very deep into the pan European development. Um, and this committee was very um, um, very smart in always choosing the right people for this prize. Um, and part of this committee was the mayor of Aachen, the um, provost, I think it is, of the college, and the rector of the university, the president. So it was two of them were still the same powers which are embodied in these two big buildings in the center of the city. And these people every year choose now um, different personalities who made themselves, um, uh, who have merit in doing something for Europe. And uh, here you see the fifth and the sixth um, of those who got the prize, Konrad Adenauer and Winston Churchill. And even though the time is short, short I want to read out what the charter says uh, regarding the awarding of Winston Churchill. It's my translation from a very tricky German. The International Charlemagne Prize of the city of Aachen for the year 1955 was awarded, awarded on the ascendant day of the year 1956, the 10th of May, in the Reichssaal, that's the original, so that's the Empire Hall, of the Aachen Town Hall, the former Imperial Palace, the Imperial Pfalz, the original says, to the British Prime Minister in the time of difficult decision-making, Sir Winston Churchill, in recognition of his merit in defending the highest human good, the freedom, and in calling the youth to secure the future of Europe by, and now comes the German word, Einigo which can mean understanding or conciliation, but also unification. So, this prize, um, and it's important to say that for the prize, actually, uh, what is done on this very day when the prize is awarded, there's first a mass in the cathedral, and then they all go to the town hall, to the coronation hall, and there the prize is awarded with something which I read out right now. Um, so what Aachen got back was a coronation. It's just now called the International Charlemagne Prize. And already this started to change very much um, the idea on who Charlemagne was and what Aachen was. It changed the architectural history. He can see the changing interpretation of this heritage in three models of um, of um, the palace, of the palace. Uh, I don't want to get into detail um, of these different models, but you see the appearance of this model from 1925 by Buchtema and um is still a somewhat Rhenish German castle. The model of 1965 is more of an elegant French building. By Hugot, that is. And the 1981 model by Hugot is now the, the idea of bringing back the Roman idea to this, um, to this Pfalz building. So a very, very harsh change. Um, immediately after 1945, also the pilgrimages continued to be. And you see here uh, the pilgrimage 1951. Again, um, this marvelous uh, reliquary of the spell of Charlemagne is carried through the city. Um, and this gives also 
another insight in how the figure of Charlemagne changed within Aachen itself. But not only within Aachen, with the pilgrimages, but in 1965, we find a French stamp with Charlemagne. And in the 70s, I forgot 72, I think, we also find the cathedral put on a stamp by, from a German perspective, by the arch enemy. Um, the German stamp only came one year later. Mm -hmm. um, the idea of um, that, that history, if it's not contaminated, can be used for the future is observed also with the uh, reconstruction of the towers of the town hall. You see here different models uh, from a competition in 1967, 1968. Um, and here is still the idea of trying maybe to make something more modern, especially this one by, by a student of our faculty at that time, uh, a reinterpretation of history. But what eventually was built uh, was according to this Merian etching, um, yeah, an historic reconstruction of these towers. But now to the cathedral itself. Um, luckily, the, the idea of preserving uh, built heritage came into, um, into the hands of politicians who knew how to execute this. And with the World Heritage Convention in 1975, it became an international obligation to look uh, for the preservation of cultural heritage. And um, at UNESCO, at the World Heritage Center, one decided to have a committee to, from a certain year on, choose different historic monuments to become part of a World Heritage List. You know that. So the first, um, the first meeting was in 1978 in Washington, D.C. And Aachen Cathedral was number three on this list to be decided a World Heritage. Um, this always sounds very nice, but if you look in, uh, in what actually happened there, a political process, uh, it becomes way less um, astonishing. Because uh, at that time, only members who already signed the charter could hand in something for the list, and it was by far not every country in the world who had signed the convention yet. And in the committee itself, there were members uh, of Australia, Canada, Ecuador, Egypt, France, West Germany, Iran, Iraq, Nigeria, Poland, Tunisia, United States, and Yugoslavia. And um, from the 12 first um, World Heritage enlistings, Two came from Canada, two came from Ecuador, one came from Germany, two from Poland, the one from Tunisia was deferred but became World Heritage two years later, and two from the United States. So um, the ones who became actually a World Heritage site were all members of the committee. Um, but in general, from the 33 uh, entries at this, in this very first year, in the end, only seven didn't make it to come onto the list. So um, maybe that's not too bad. I will. This is um, the evaluation document by Iconos, and you see here the number three. By the way, the listing is just an administrative process. Uh, they were numbered according to the date when they came in. So nothing special about this number three. But what you can see here, what becomes World Heritage is Charlemagne's own Palatine Chapel, which is due to four of um, the eight different uh, criteria. And here comes the interesting thing. The construction of the Chapel of the Emperor at Aix symbolized the unification of the West and its spiritual and political revival under the Aegis of Charlemagne. So if you now skip under the Aegis of Charlemagne, this is exactly what politically was happening after the war. I have to skip this. Yes, unfortunate. Um, the problem, actually, for an under for a comprehensive understanding of uh, Carolingian heritage is that it it's not all the remains of Carolingian times became actually world heritage, but only 
Charlemagne's own Palatine Chapel. Later on, it was changed to Aachen Cathedral. So the integrity of Aachen Cathedral became part of the list, not the town hall. And this was a, especially recently uh, an attempt by the city administration to try to sneak also the town hall into this World Heritage status. Um, there was even an application for a minor, um, a minor extension of um, the World Heritage listing, which then was withdrawn because the committee told the, the mayor at that time that it might not work out this way. It will not be a minor extension but a major extension, and the major extension is counted as an originally new entry. Um, so that's why in the end this plan was uh, withdrawn, but Aachen was still lacking the important buffer zone for the cathedral itself, and this was done only recently in 2013. The city administration drew a boundary for the World Heritage site of the Aachen Cathedral, and you see this is almost everything of the inner city of Aachen, including, of course, the town hall and any other potential Carolingian remain. By the way, the red, the red um, buildings here are those who are actually already under, um, um, under state authority <coughs> for the preservation. Uh, and actually, these are all the buildings that are left after, that, that remain during the war. Apart from these political things, we are today very happy uh, to have come together in a working group that apart from too much political thinking is now um, trying to understand the heritage itself, how it developed and how we can further develop it. Um, and parts of this working group, apart from Judith, of course, who is the speaker actually, um, is members of the universities from the departments of history, of uh, historic preservation, of architectural history. Um, so that is RWTH. Aachen University is the city of Aachen, and it is also the College of Aachen, which for um, decades was always a problem because the fight between the city and the college always continued, especially also over who is the actual owner of Charlemagne. So what we were able to do is uh, drawing a complete document, actually what is there, this is the first plan that puts together the town hall and the cathedral in one um, plan which is actually scaled and every uh, position is measured in a correct way. We have of course the, the city archaeology um, which is doing a lot in understanding more about the Carolingian heritage, while um, we are not as lucky as apparently here uh, in Scotland. In Germany you can have archaeological excavations only when there is a building project. So um, anything else is called luxury excavations and they are forbidden. You cannot just make an excavation to know more, not in, not in Germany. Um, and in the end it's of course uh, the idea of how to make better the surroundings of um, the, the World Heritage Site and also how to, to make people better understand what is actually Carolingian within the city, what comes from other uh, decades from other centuries and how all these together amalgamated um, into what we see today. Uh, by the way, in this image you can see very nicely that until today cathedral and town hall turn the backs against each other. The entrances are always on the other side. So what happened recently is uh, some improvements such as this uh, so-called archaeological vitrine. Uh, you can look here into an excavation where it's prepared the, um, a Roman house, a medieval house on top of each other and it's nicely explained. So the people see that even Aachen has a history which goes back not only to Charlemagne but before. We have um, nice new steps. Uh, not in front, but in the back of the town hall, which is so nice because you can sit here and look at the back of the cathedral. And my nice thing, and the Christmas market usually uh, takes place here right now also. And we have a new information center, which is um, done by the college um, 
for the church, but which also gives some information in general about Charlemagne and the city. And very important nowadays is what is called the chronoscopes. Uh, actually, it's information stands where uh, you can push a button and something is told to you and you can look through uh, uh, biculars and see something special either inside this, um, this pillar or with a view outside all these things which are important for the city marketing today. This year actually was um, the first peak, but we hope that we can continue with some peaks because it's 1,200 years of the commemoration of the death of Charlemagne as well as 600 years of the, um, uh, of the inauguration of the choir of the cathedral. And it was pilgrimage year this year, so all this came together. And um, because we had this, there was also the idea of making a big exhibition on uh, on Charlemagne um, and Carolingian history. And you see, even our president came to open this uh, this exhibition, which was marketed actually with um, with this reliquary with the facial uh, impression of Charles IV, but with the skull of Charlemagne. Um, but also here, it's very interestingly to see like where did the president stand um, to greet the people. He was not standing in front of the cathedral, but in front of the town hall, uh, in the very square which was so badly represented in the state portrait I showed you in the beginning um, of this small talk. And I, yeah, it's, I'm almost in time. This was. Um, at least they tried to put 65 years onto a stamp on, into 30 minutes, which is uh, not so easy. I had to omit some things, uh, but I hope this gave you a small insight into the particularity of what happened in the recent years, but also what made Aachen a world heritage and what did the world heritage do onto Aachen. Thank you very much.